Okay, we are going to go ahead and get started this afternoon um, because Nancy and I have quite a bit of information that we want to share with you and we want to make sure that we get through all of it. So welcome everyone to our IDC webinar on Part B Suspension Expulsion, What You Need to Know About Indicator B4. This Back to Basics webinar provides an overview of B4A, which addresses significant discrepancy in the rates of suspension and expulsions for children ages 3 through 21 with IEPs, and B4B, which addresses significant discrepancy in the rates of suspension and expulsions by race ethnicity for children ages 3 to 21 with IEPs. I'm Julie Ballmer, co-director of IDC, and I'm joined today by Nancy O'Hara, who's an IDC state liaison and also a member of our Disproportionality and Equity Workgroup for IDC. We are anticipating a pretty large number of attendees today, so we are keeping the lines muted during the webinar. We ask that you make use of the chat box if you have any questions or comments throughout our webinar, and we will be doing the best that we can to make sure that we respond to as many comments as we can during the next hour. Throughout this webinar, we will use significant discrepancy to describe indicators 4A and 4B. We'll use a form of the term suspension expulsion to refer to out-of-school suspension expulsions totaling greater than 10 days, as these are the data that states are required to examine for indicators B4A and B4B. With this webinar, we'll cover the basics of B4. This webinar is intended to provide an overview of this indicator for staff who are new or who want a refresher. It is not meant to take a deeper dive into this indicator. We'll start by discussing the requirements of the indicators, the two comparison options for indicator B4, and also the data sources that you'll need. We'll then review common methodologies that states can use to identify districts with significant discrepancy. We'll then discuss some cautions for indicator B4, particularly around its relationship with the other equity requirements in IDEA. We'll then end the webinar with a summary and some helpful resources. So let's go ahead and get started. And I am going to turn things over to Nancy O'Hara, who is going to get us started with our discussion of the requirements. Great, good afternoon, thank you, Julie. Hi, everybody. So we're going to start today with, that's not working, B4A and significant discrepancy in discipline. Um, you can see that the wording of the indicator is there, and it's that states must report the percent of districts that have a significant discrepancy in the rate of suspension and expulsions for children with disabilities. In order to do that, states have to have defined significant discrepancy. Although the indicator requires you to report a certain percent, it gives states some flexibility in how they define significant discrepancy. So significant discrepancy will be defined by your comparison option that you select, the methodology for doing your calculations, as well as threshold, and some of you will also use a minimum in or cell size. And we're going to talk about all of these as we move through the next hour. So just know that that's all part of the definition of significant discrepancy. As most of you probably know, B4A is reported in the state performance plan. It is an indicator. It is a results indicator. Um, the target is set by the state up with the advice of your stakeholders. Um, and in the APR, what you will do is compare your state's actual performance to the target that was set. And if there is any slippage, of course, you'll explain that. B4A, as opposed to B4B, when we get to it in a little while, is only is a one-step process. So your basic responsibility is to determine which of your districts or LEAs meet the state's definition of significant discrepancy. So you'll review the data 
on um, expansion, suspensions and expulsions for greater than 10 days for all of the LEAs within your state. And you'll, based on the definition that you've created, and you'll determine which of those meet that definition, and that's the percentage that you'll report. B4A does require a review of policies, procedures, and practices, but it happens basically after you've um, made the um, determination of who meets the definition of significant discrepancy. So states are required to ensure that a review of policies, procedures, and practices is conducted with any LEA or district that met, that is determined to have significant discrepancy. However, whether or not you find compliance, non-compliance when you conduct that review does not impact those who met it for the indicator report. Um, and certainly if you find an LEA that um, had non-compliance in the policies, procedures, and practices, then you must require them to correct that non-compliance in accordance with OSEP memo 0902. Most states, and, and I'll probably say this again when we talk about um, B4B, conduct this um, policies, practices, and procedures review in one of two ways, either through a self-assessment that the state has created they give out to the LEAs that are required to conduct it, and the LEAs submit it back. The state reviews that and makes some determinations of compliance or noncompliance. Um, the other way that states, probably the second most common way that states do this, is through either a desk audit or an on-site visit, but state direct monitoring of the LEA for the records that would relate to this indicator. We're going to move on to B4B, and yes, that whole slide, as you probably are familiar, is the language of the indicator. It happens to be a, a lengthy indicator, but we've highlighted some of the words that I, we think are critical for this one. So th the first difference in B4B is that it is significant discrepancy by race or ethnicity. And again, it's in the rates of suspensions and expulsions of greater than 10 days in a school year. And there are policies, practices, or procedures that have contributed to the significant discrepancy and are not in compliance with IDA requirements. So it is an A and a B, which is right in the language of the indicator to clearly note that it's a two-step um, action. Again, as with a, a state must have a definition of significant discrepancy that's going to talk about comparison method, uh, calculation method, what kind of threshold or bar are you looking at, as well as if you choose to use any minimum in or cell sizes. All of those things create your definition, and then the districts in the state are compared against that definition, this time by race or ethnicity. Um, it's also very important while we're here, and I don't want to forget to say it, that we, um, as Julie have already alluded to, that what we do for B4B cannot be confused with the requirements related to significant disproportionality and discipline. Um, the requirements are different. States should not use the same calculations and definitions for determining significant discrepancy or here, B4B, as they use for significant disproportionality. We're going to talk about this a lot in the section that we called B4 cautions. Um, I, I wanted to point it out because this is an area where states have had a lot of confusion in the past. So we think it's important to be really clear on this section. Um, as you know, B4B is reported in the SPP APR. B uh, B4B is a compliance indicator as opposed to A, which was a results indicator. So the target must be zero for B4B. Um, and states must compare your actual performance to the target and explain any slippage, of course, in the APR. 
B4B is a two-step process. So if you'll remember with A, it's only one step. You just looked at your district to see who met your definition. Here we start with the similar process. So we look at the data for the state, look at each LEA's data to determine who meets the state definition of significant discrepancy. And then for those that meet that definition, we determine if they have policies, procedures, or practices that contribute to the significant discrepancy and do not comply with the requirements related to IDA. And it is important to note that um, OSEP has been very specific in the indicator, and it's repeated here on this slide, that it is the requirements of IDEA, but specifically looking at those related to the development and implementation of IEPs, the use of positive behavioral interventions and supports, and procedural safeguards. So it's pretty prescriptive in the, the kinds of areas that you're going to look at. So as we just said, as I just said, states must conduct this policy procedure, uh, review of policy procedure and practice for any district that met that definition. Um, you identify a district with significant discrepancy by race and ethnicity only when they met the state definition and they had non-compliance um, after you've done the policies, procedures, and practice review. So there's a very distinct difference between A and B and when the review comes in and how it impacts the determination of significant discrepancy. And of course, if you find significant dis um, find non-compliance in significant discrepancy, you must require those districts to correct that identified non-compliance. So we're going to test your knowledge and let you just think to yourself about this. But I also want to point out that we're kind of ending the nearing the end of this first section. So if you have any specific questions about what we've just said, feel free to use the chat box and think about this question. Which of the following is true about B4A? It's a results indicator. States are permitted to set their own targets. It uses a one-step process to identify districts or all of the above. And the answer is D, all of the above. So just as a summary, as we said, A is a results indicator. They set you, set your own targets and it only is a one-step process. Let's test your knowledge one more time. Which of the following is false about B4B? It is a compliance indicator. States must set the target at 100%. It uses a two-step process to identify districts or none of the above. And the answer is B. 100% um, was not correct. States must set their target at 0% for this compliance indicator. Um, a was true, it is a compliance indicator, and C was true, it is a two-step process. Okay, we're now going to talk about the comparison options. One of those first decisions that you have to make um, in your, when you are developing your definition of significant discrepancy for either A or for B, um, you must have choose a comparison option. So you are required to compare um, the data um, about districts in one of two ways. So you may choose to compare the rates of suspensions expulsions for children with disabilities among all the districts within your state or you can choose to compare the rates of suspensions and expulsions for children with disabilities to children without disabilities within one district. So again, I think this is um, information that most of, our, most of us have been used to using as we've moved along. States may have different comparison methods for A and for B. You're also not required to keep using the same method once you've made a decision. You could change it down the road if you um, think, decide that that's something you wanted to do as a state. 
we reviewed, we looked into the indicator analysis that OSEP publishes every year about how states are, um, what the state data looks like and how states are um, making, using the reporting for the SPP indicators. And so you can see here on, there's a, a slide for both, I mean a chart for both B4A and B4B that most states use comparison option one. Comparison option one, for sake of brevity on these slides, is the comparison of children with disabilities among all the LEAs in the state. And you can see in both A and B, that's where most of the states, um, this is two years worth of data, that's where most of the states um, go with the comparison methodology. But you can see that those numbers change just a little bit in the two years that we have in this slide. So states do not stick to the same method necessarily all the time. They may change for some reason. And comparison option two is the option of comparing students with disabilities to students without disabilities within a district. And you can see that there are also a number of states, although less than the first option, that do that every year. So, and again, there's slight changes because Probably if they went from one to the other, then um, it impacts both. But So those are the comparison options, and that shows you how states um, are using it. So there's some considerations to think about. And um, one, as I've already said, states may use different comparison options for B4A and B4B. Um, you don't have to use the same one at all. And, but you have to think about it when you're thinking about the comparison options, um, that you may not collect all the data needed or have access to it if you want to use the comparison option of students without disabilities within a district. Do you have all of that data on children without disabilities? Does your department have access to that? So that is a piece to think about and think about how timely would that data be and is it available. You also want to think about what do the comparisons tell you. So if you compare children with disabilities to children without disabilities within a district, then if in District A, let's say, if that District A suspends and expels lots of kids and there's not much difference, between students with and without disabilities, then you probably won't see much about um, disproportionality there unless there's differences among the races um, when you're looking at B. But if you have District A, as I said, as a high suspender, they like to suspend kids. That's their go-to um, disciplinary practice. And you compare that district um, students with disabilities among all the other district students with disabilities, then you may see where some of that significant discrepancy is occurring. So you'll want to think about this um, within your state, um, and it's a decision that you may want to come back to every now and then and think, is this still the right way? We've gotten a lot better in our state and our disciplinary practices. Maybe it's time to think about uh, other methodology um, or the other comparison method. So it's it's a decision that you make, and but you could come back to it over time and think about it again. So I'm going to test your knowledge one more time. So this is true or false. If you select the option for comparing children within a district, then you will need to make sure that you have access to suspension expulsion data for children without disabilities. True or false? And the answer is true. Certainly the comparison within a district is that comparison rate of children with and without disability. So sometimes that's a challenge for special education to get for this data to have all that data on children without disabilities. So just be aware of that. I am now going to turn it back over to Julie, and she's going to help us talk about data sources. Thank you, Nancy. All right, so switching gears a little bit, um, although Nancy's already touched a little bit on the data sources um, that are going to be needed. So 
let's go ahead and dig in. So the comparison option that your state selects is going to dictate what data you're going to need in order to calculate those suspension expulsion rates. So B, both B4A and B4B require states to use the data collected for reporting under Section 618 of IDEA. It's important to remember that any data that you use to calculate the analyses for indicator B4 is what we're calling on this slide lag data. Um, that means that it's from the school year before the actual reporting period. So for example, if you're getting ready for your next APR that's going to be due in February of 2018, um, that's the FFY 2016 APR, those data are actually going to come from the 2015-16 school year for B4. So there's that one year lag as compared to the rest of the data that you're going to be reporting in your FFY 2016 APR. Um, and just another reminder that, again, these are data for children ages 3 through 21. Um, a lot of the indicators require 6 to 21, but this one is actually 3 to 21 that you're looking at suspension expulsion data for. States need to use the data collected um, for EDFACS file C006, which is the Report of Children with Disabilities IDEA Suspension Expulsions, again for ages 3 through 21, um, and for all seven racial ethnic categories in order to complete the analyses for indicator B4. Um, states will also need to use child count and educational environment data for children ages 6 through 21, which is C002, as well as for children ages 3 through 5, which is C089. In addition, if states are comparing suspension expulsion rates for children with disabilities to children without disabilities, then states will also need those counts of children without disabilities and also suspension expulsion data for children without disabilities. So again, that was what Nancy was talking about in the previous section. So, so for all of the calculations, you will definitely need your IDEA data, but then if you're comparing within a district those children with um, disabilities to children without disabilities, then you'll need that additional data as well. So we're going to do a quick test your knowledge, um, fill in the blank. States will need suspension expulsion data for children ages blank through blank. Um, and as we just discussed, again, it's ages 3 through 21. And another one, um, states must use blank suspension expulsion data totaling greater than 10 days. And we're looking here for out-of-school suspension expulsion data totaling greater than 10 days. So now we're going to move on and talk a little bit about methodologies. So this is another decision point. Um, Nancy discussed the first one, um, which is your comparison option. So your first decision that you need to make is which comparison option that you're going to use. And then your next decision that you're going to make is what methodology are you going to use. And so. These are definitely sequential because the comparison option that you select impacts which methods that you can use and which ones are going to be appropriate. So during this section, we're only going to highlight a couple of different methods, um, and that's just because of the time that we have allowed for this webinar. Um, you can definitely find more information about other methodologies in our IDC TA guide on indicator B4. Um, and we will definitely put that link up and put the full name of that TA guide um, when Nancy talks about resources at the end of this webinar. So states may select different methods for B4A and B4B, and if you've selected a different comparison option for B4A and B4B, then that may actually be what you have to do um, in order to make sure that your method for that indicator is appropriate. So first we're going to talk about the first comparison option, 
And again, just as a reminder, that involves comparing suspension expulsion rates for children with disabilities among the districts within a state. So as we discussed, um, states can choose among different options to make this comparison. Um, in the TA guide, we discussed some different options such as percentiles, rate ratios, standard deviations. Um, the most popular option or the most common option that states tend to use to make this comparison um, for either B4A or B4B is simply comparing the district rate to the state rate. So for B4A, that means comparing the district level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities to the state level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities. For B4B, this means comparing the district level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities from each racial ethnic group to the state level suspension rate for children with disabilities. So we're gonna walk through how to calculate the rates that you'll need in order to use this methodology. So in this example, um, this is again for B4A. So district one, had 24 children with disabilities suspended, expelled, and there are 110 children with disabilities in this district. So the district suspension expulsion rate is 21.8% because all we do is divide the children with disabilities suspended, expelled by the all children with disabilities in that district. State A, which is the bottom rate example that you have, is children um, is calculating that state rate. So if this, the state here had 759 children with disabilities suspended, expelled, and there are 6,479 children with disabilities in the state, we would simply divide those two numbers and we would get a rate of 11.7%. So in this case, if the state level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities for state A is 11.7%, then District 1 suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities, which is 21.8, is higher than the state level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities. So at this point, the state will need to set a threshold for when significant discrepancy is occurring. Um, they're gonna have to figure out how much of a discrepancy they're willing to tolerate in their state before it becomes significant. So we'll talk about thresholds in a couple of minutes. Um, but first I wanna keep going through the different rates. And I see that there are some, some chat questions coming in, which it looks like Nancy's responding um, to. So, so I'm right. at, not break at the moment, I'm gonna keep going through this and then um, hopefully we'll cover those questions as well. So moving on, we're next gonna go through an example um, for B4B. Um, and this is very, very similar to the calculation that we just went through. So first what we're gonna do is we're gonna calculate the suspension expulsion rate for black or African American children in District 1. And we're gonna do that by dividing the three black or African American children with disabilities who were suspended expelled by the total number of black or African American children with disabilities. So this suspension expulsion rate for the district comes out to 10%. We're then gonna use the same state rate that we just calculated on the previous slide. Note that this is the suspension expulsion rate for all children with disabilities in the state. The suspension expulsion rate for each of the racial ethnic groups in each district is compared to this same state rate. So in this example, if the suspension expulsion rate for black or African American children with disabilities in District 1 is 10%, that is lower than State A's suspension expulsion rate for all children with disabilities, which is 11.7%. So no significant discrepancy exists for this particular racial ethnic group in this district. Okay, so again, um, there are other methodologies that, that states can use that are acceptable for comp that first comparison option where you're comparing children with disabilities 
among the districts within the state. Um, we just covered one. Um, we would absolutely encourage um, states, if you're interested in exploring those other options, to look at our B4TA guide, um, which walks you through all of those various options. Um, I am going to now switch gears and talk about the second comparison option. Um, if your state chooses to use this comparison option, which compares the rates of suspension expulsions for children with disabilities to the rates for children without disabilities within each district, then there are two different calculation methodologies. Um, we're going to discuss the rate ratio in our examples. So for this particular example, for B4A, the rate ratio compares a district level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities to the same district suspension expulsion rate for all children without disabilities. And for B4B, the rate ratio compares the district level suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities from each racial ethnic group to the same district suspension expulsion rate for all children without disabilities. So we're going to walk through an example, because um, I know that that was a lot to absorb in, in that one slide there. So first, for, first we're going to talk about an example for B4A. So in this particular example, we're going to calculate rates for children with and without disabilities. So in the first box, we calculate the rate for children with disabilities by dividing the children with disabilities suspended expelled in District 1 by the total number of children with disabilities in District 1. So we're doing that 24 by 110, and we're getting a rate of 21.8. So in this district, 21.8% of their children with disabilities were suspended expelled. The second calculation is we do that for children without disabilities within that same district. You'll see that this is still within District 1. So we're going to calculate the rate for children without disabilities by dividing the suspension expulsion rate for children. I'm sorry, we're going to divide the children, the number of suspension expulsions for children without disabilities in District 1 by the total number of children without disabilities in District 1. So that, again, gives you 75 divided by the 925 for a suspension expulsion rate of 8.1%. So we have both of our rates. And in order to get the rate ratio, what we're going to do is divide these two rates. Um, so we're going to divide that 21.8 by 8.1. And what we find is that in this district, the suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities is 2.69 times that of children without disabilities. So again, the state would need to determine a threshold for determining when that discrepancy is going to be found to be significant. So again, this comparison and this methodology is all within the district. We're not using any of the state level data for this comparison. It's comparing children with disabilities to children without disabilities within one district. Now we're going to make it just a little bit comp more complicated, um, and we're going to look at B4B, which again is where we're throwing in the race ethnicity piece. Um, so again, this rate ratio is very, very similar to the one that we just calculated. Um, what we're going to do first, however, is calculate the rate for the racial ethnic group in District 1. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide the number of Hispanic Latino children with disabilities who were suspended expelled by the total number of Hispanic Latino children with disabilities in that district. So in this particular district, there were 10 Hispanic Latino children who were suspended expelled, and there were 35 um, Hispanic Latino children with disabilities in that district. So we get a suspension expulsion rate of 28.6%. Then we compare that to the rate, we compare that rate to the suspension expulsion rate for all children without disabilities within that same district. So this is the exact same rate that we just calculated in B4A. Um, if we go back a couple of slides, you can see that this is the exact same rate if you look at that bottom one. 
We have 75 children without disabilities who are suspended, expelled. We have 925 total children without disabilities. And we're gonna divide those two and get that same rate of 8.1. So in this district, if we do that comparison, we find that we divide those rates and we find that the suspension and expulsion rate for children, for Hispanic children with disabilities is 3.5 times the suspension and expulsion rate for all children without disabilities in that district. So it's important that you're comparing in each district the suspension and expulsion rate for each race ethnicity, for each racial ethnic group to the suspension expulsion rate for all children without disabilities. So again, I know we just went through quite a bit of information um, about how to calculate different rates, um, depending on whether you're using comparison option one or whether you're using comparison option two, um, which are the comparing um, suspension and expulsion rate for children with disabilities um, within the state or else comparing children with disabilities to children without disabilities within a district. Um, I know that we went through a lot of rates. Um, and so we would definitely encourage you um, to look at our B4TA guide, which provides a lot more op information about different methodologies that you might use, um, and, and again, provides those step-by-step -step directions for how to calculate each one of those methods. Um, Julie, before be, be, yeah. Julie, before you go on, there is one question that I could not completely answer, and it asks about OSEP's measurement table. It's about data to be used. It does not okay. specify out-of-school suspension. Rather, it says suspensions and expulsions for greater than 10 days. Does it really have to be out-of-school, or can it include in-school suspensions and expulsions of greater than 10 days as well? Great question, Mickey. Um, you're correct that the measurement table from OSEP does not specify. Um, when IDC created the B4TA guide that I keep referencing, um, we actually worked hand in hand with um, OSEP, um, OGC, and OCR. Um, and that TA guide was vetted by all of those various offices within the Department of Ed. And our understanding from working with each of those offices that it, it, it is um, the out of school suspension expulsions totaling greater than 10 days. Um, it is not including the in school suspension expulsion data. You are very welcome. I'll pause here and ask if there are any other questions before we hit the small cell sizes and the thresholds. If there are, again, remember you're on mute, so we do ask that you um, put anything in the chat box. Okay. Um, if something does come to mind, please feel free to enter that. We will, like I said, try to answer all of the questions that come in. Um, so let's talk a little bit about small cell sizes. Um, so this is part of the decision um, that states have to make when you're choosing your methodology. So any of the calculations that we just discussed, um, any of the rates that we just walked through how to calculate, can be unreliable if the number of children included in those analyses is small. And so unreliable analyses caused by small cell sizes can result in districts being inappropriately identified with having a significant discrepancy. And the most common method that states use to address small cell sizes is to identify a minimum number of children to be included in those analyses. So this is often referred to as a minimum N size or a minimum cell size. When deciding whether to implement a minimum cell size and figuring out what that should be, um, it's very important for states to realize that there really is no perfect value. Um, any minimum cell size definitely has its trade-offs and its limitations. 
um, states need to make sure that they're balancing the possibility of inappropriately identifying districts because of those small cell sizes against the possibility of not identifying districts because of large minimum cell sizes that eliminate large number of districts from the analyses completely. So it is very much a trade-off. Um, if you have too low of a minimum cell size or choose not to use one, then you may have unreliable analyses identifying districts that perhaps you shouldn't. Um, if you use too large of a minimum cell size, though, then you risk, run the risk of eliminating all of your districts right off the bat and not actually including those that may have issues in the analyses, so they don't even make it to that point. Um, all right, uh, going to the next slide, let's talk a little bit about thresholds because we've alluded to them quite a bit at this point in time. Um, for any of the methods, states will need to set a threshold for determining when a significant discrepancy um, is occurring. So all of the methodologies that we walked through and that we talked about basically tell you whether or not there's a discrepancy between the different rates. Um, however, they don't tell you whether or not that, that discrepancy is considered significant. Um, the state needs to set a threshold um, for when they consider any type of discrepancy to be significant, meaning that it requires some type of action by the state and by the district. Um, so for example, if you're using a rate ratio, you need to set a rate ratio threshold as to when that difference there, that, that ratio becomes unacceptable um, within your state. So states must set thresholds for both B4A and B4B. And the thresholds may be different um, since they are related to the methodology. Um, and they must be reported as part of the state's definition of significant discrepancy. So let's do a, a test your knowledge um, at the end, and then um, we'll revisit the chat box um, as well. Um, so a state decides that they want to calculate a rate ratio that within a district compares the suspension expulsion rate for black or African American children with disabilities to the suspension expulsion rate for black or African American children without disabilities in that same district. Is this acceptable? The answer is no, it is not acceptable. Um, states should compare the suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities from each racial ethnic group to the suspension expulsion rate for all children without disabilities in that same district. If you use the district level suspension expulsion rate for children without disabilities for each racial ethnic group as the basis for that comparison, then that means that a different comparison rate is being used to determine significant discrepancy for each racial ethnic group in that district. And the Department of Education has stated that absent a valid justification for treating different racial ethnic groups differently, um, this method is unacceptable. Any additional questions that have come in, Nancy, that, that we need to go back to? Um, I believe I was able to answer the last one that came in. Okay, good, good. Okay, so Let's um, talk a little bit about the B4 cautions. Um, so there are some important points to remember about calculating significant discrepancy for indicator B4B in particular. So first, states cannot use the methods that they use for B9, B10, and significant disproportionality for the significant discrepancy calculation for B4B. The B9, B10 calculations and significant dis disproportionality calculations 
do not use either of the comparison options that are required by indicator B4B. So states should not use or calculate a risk ratio within each district. I'm sorry, states should not calculate a risk ratio within each district that compares the suspension expulsion rate for children with disabilities from one racial ethnic group to the risk for children with disabilities from all other racial ethnic groups. So again, that is not allowed. And let's walk through um, an example as to, to why, why those methods aren't appropriate. So at the bottom of this slide, you will see um, a formula. And this is a formula that you might use if you were calculating a risk ratio, um, let's say for significant disproportionality, looking at a discipline category. Um, here, within the district, we compare the percentage of children with disabilities from a racial ethnic group who are suspended expelled to the percentage of all other children with disabilities who are suspended expelled in that same district. So this risk ratio does not compare among districts within the state. And that's because you're comparing within the district. So it doesn't meet that first comparison option that we discussed. It doesn't compare among districts within the state. It also does not compare children with disabilities to children without disabilities, which is that second comparison option. Instead, it compares children with disabilities to children with disabilities. And therefore, um, for those reasons, because it doesn't use either of the different comparison options, um, this method is inappropriate and unacceptable for B4B. So again, <laughs> please do not use that method. Um, it's also um, important to note that states cannot use the significant discrepancy analyses that they use for B4B to meet the discipline analysis requirements of significant disproportionality. The rate ratios that are calculated for B4B are not acceptable for significant disproportionality, which requires states to use risk ratios and alternate risk ratios. In addition, for significant disproportionality, states must analyze five different discipline categories to make sure that they're getting at incidence, type, and duration. For B4B, states are only analyzing data for out-of-school suspension expulsions totaling greater than 10 days. So just keep in mind that significant discrepancy in discipline and significant disproportionality are very different requirements in IDEA and require very different calculations and different data sources. So another quick test your knowledge. You cannot use the same calculations for B4B that you use for B9 and B10, true or false. And that one is absolutely true. Um, you should not calculate risk ratios for B4B. All right, Nancy, I think we're down to about 10 minutes. So I'm going to pass this back to you for a summary um, and to make sure that we, we show where they can get all those resources that we've been talking about. Absolutely. And as we do that, we also want to encourage you to be adding any final questions into the chat box that you may have as we go through this. Um, so as a quick summary, B4A is a results indicator, and as a state, you get to set the target. B4B is a compliance indicator, and the target must be zero. States, in developing their definition of significant discrepancy, can choose the comparison option, the calculation methodology, the threshold, and of course, minimum cell size requirements. And again, these do not have to be the same for A and for B. They can vary by the indicator as well. Your data that you're going to use is children ages 3 through 21 with disabilities, and you'll need all seven racial and ethnic groups to um, conduct the analysis for 4B. Um, you cannot, as Julie clearly talked to us about, um, 
use the results of the B4B analysis to meet the significant disproportionality requirements. And likewise, what you're going to use for significant disproportionality and discipline does not meet the requirements of what you're going to use for B4B. She talked about the different comparisons and how they do not meet the requirements. Um, so I want to tell you about a few of these resources, and we are, as I think you know, we're recording this, and it will all be available with the PowerPoint once the recording is final and you can get to these links. But first of all, OSEP has some resources to support you, and those are found in the SPP APR uh, resources tab on the GRADS 360, um, such as the measurement table, the related requirements table, as, and the indicator analyses documents. So I think we've referred to all of those throughout this presentation. So there's your first set of resources. IDC has resources, and um, Julie referred multiple times to the indicator B4 technical assistance guide, and so that one is there. Um, you can always find that on the IDA re data resource library. At, um, and the other one to think about is there's a new document called Equity Requirements in IDEA, which really compares all the different IDEA equity requirements. It compares B4 to 9 and 10 to significant disproportionality at a high level, but it compares across many factors like what data do you use, what what are the requirements for a district if they're identified, what are the requirements for the state if they identify, um, and others. Methodology, all of that is included. So it's maybe a helpful resource as well. All of the IDC resources, of course, can be found um, at the resource library, idadata.org resource library. Um, we have a number of uh, documents related to equity issues that could be helpful. So we have a, a couple of minutes, maybe about five minutes actually, if there's further questions or discussions that you would like to have. If there is somebody that would rather voice their question, if you use the raise your hand symbol above the chat box, then we, we can unmute somebody if you raise your hand. Otherwise, Julie, do we have new questions in the chat box? Uh, we had just a couple, but I believe they've been addressed. Okay. All right. Any further questions? Comments? Um, I won't ask you to acknowledge this, but um, those of you that may have been working on this for a while, I'm, I'm um, wondering if you um, some of the information made you think, oh, I need to go back and relook at how we do this. Um, there's always so many nuances to all of these equity requirements that it's, um, it's always important, I think, to go back and think about your process and your procedures and make sure you're doing them right. Not seeing anything come in, I'm going to go to the to the almost last slide and um, tell you that certainly um, there's help for you from IDC. You certainly can contact your state liaison. If you don't know who your state liaison is, and there's, you can find that out by going looking at the technical assistance tab on the IDA data webpage. Um, and certainly Julie and I are happy to answer your questions as well, and our emails are there. Um, you will be getting an evaluation after this webinar because you so kindly registered, and we now have your email, so you will be receiving an evaluation, and we'd really appreciate it if you would take a couple of minutes and do that evaluation. It will help us improve. This was the first of multiple webinars coming up on Back to Basics, looking at many of the SPP APR indicators. And with that, Julie, do you have anything else you want to add? Um, just a reminder that if you did find this particular webinar helpful to get back to the basics on B4, um, please do look next month um, and register for the next webinar, which 
is going to be covering another equity requirement of IDEA and focusing on indicators B9 and B10 um, for the SPP APR. So um, definitely encourage everyone to, to listen to that one as well. Thanks, everybody. Have a great afternoon. Thank you so much, everybody.